Hi, my name is Bill Vales. On this segment of Littleton Rocks, On the Road, we are going to visit one of the many mines in the Gilsom, New Hampshire area. In just the Gilsom area alone, there are more than 60 mines indicated on the map that we used when we visited this area. Gilsom is a bit northwest of our last Littleton Rocks on the road, road trip, which was, if you remember, in the Marlboro, New Hampshire area. Now, this entire area was known for mining some of the largest feldspar, mica, and beryl deposits in the world. Both mica and beryl were strategic materials used during World War II. Feldspar is a common material that makes up 60% of the earth, Earth's crust. It is used in porcelain products such as pottery, sanitary ware, tableware, tiles, and other things. A future Littleton Rocks on the Road will be discussing the attributes of these three minerals and more. However, this Littleton Rocks on the Road takes us to one of the Pomlo Mines in Gilsom, New Hampshire. The Pomlo Mine is the site of many of the fine pegmatite areas in New Hampshire. Pegmatites are a granitoid rock consisting of quartz, feldspar, mica, both biotite mica and muscovite mica, and numerous other minerals prized by collectors for their size and shape. Pegmatite crystals tend to cool very slow, and as a result of this, they are able to grow into the crystal form that actually mirrors their atomic structure. Okay, a quick lesson on granite. Sometimes we group together a lot of different rock types as granite. In fact, there are different types of granite that a geologist would refer to as granitoid rocks. Granites are classified based on mineral composition, grain size, color, and numerous other attributes. Let's look at a few examples. Okay, over here we have an example that is of um, uh, diorite. This is diorite. And you'll notice on this diorite sample, the uh, grain size is very small. It's it's hard for you to see any large crystals in there, and that's because there aren't any. It's very small. So relatively speaking, this would have cooled uh, uh, quicker than a pegmatite. Next to it, we have a, um, a granodiorite. And some of this is a little bit of guesswork on my part because I would need a little chemical analysis to confirm this, but the granodiorite uh, it differs from the diorite in that there's the absence of quartz. And to my eye, this appears not to have quartz in it. This example here is nice. And this piece of nice you'll, is a nice piece of nice. I always have to say that. You'll notice has a certain amount of banding in it. And this banding is formed by the metamorphic compression of rock types during continental collisions that results in, in uh, uh, like minerals uh, collecting together. Here's another piece of, of uh, uh, granite. We would, we, would, we would call this granite. And of these pieces here, they differ probably in the amount of feldspar in them, the amount of quartz, and a few other minerals. This piece here is a piece of gabbro. G-A-B-B-R-O, and gabbro is a type of granitic rock, granitoid rock, and this underlies most of the oceanic crust. And this, I believe, came from India, where there are a lot of basalt um, uh, flows there. This piece is an example of a pegmatite, and this was found in New Hampshire. And you can see on this, this has some fairly large crystals, of quartz, feldspar, some mica. You see some beautiful pieces of mica. The uh, lighter color mica is uh, muscovite mica, and the darker mica is biotite mica. This, this sample right here is, was found in a pegmatite, and this is exclusively mica. 
uh, and it forms, the, these are all crystals of mica. It's actually a, a, a great piece. And um, uh, it's an example of um, multiple books of mica that have all been formed together. And um, that's what that is. So to the lay person, this is granite. However, there are variations in, in the granite rocks that we need to consider. Okay, now we have done our site reconnaissance using the USGS website that I demonstrated in our previous show when we visited the St. Pierre Quarry. So let's sit back, relax, and enjoy this visit to the Gilsum Pegmatite area of southern New Hampshire. Hi, here we are at the Pomelo Mine in Gilsum, New Hampshire. Um, we're fairly deep in the woods. I frankly can't believe that we were able to drive in here. And the Pomelo Mine is uh, what's called a pegmatite. And what a pegmatite is, is a large deposit of igneous rock that has cooled very, very slowly. And the results of that very, very slow cooling has allowed crystals to grow quite large in size. And of course, a pegmatite is a prized area for collectors of mineral specimens. We're in a fairly deep uh, forest that's been mined. There's a lot of hemlock around. I see a lot of fir trees. And there are deposits of, of um, quartz all around, quartz and feldspar. And um, we're going to be picking that up as we proceed through the mine. Behind me here is an area that has been mined that's probably I'm going to say it's about 50 feet deep, and it's filled with water right now, so I don't know how deep uh, the water would be. And there's a wall on the other side, and I can also see an area uh, over here um, that some digging has occurred in. And up on top is a series of what's called tailings, which are the result of the mining process, or just deposits uh, that are becoming unearthed just through erosion and whatnot. But it's a, it's a fairly impressive area, and uh, I hope uh, we're able to get out of here. We're trying to sight down a fallen tree to give you a, a sense of the depth. The ledge is uh, fairly sharp. You wouldn't want to take that one false step. Hi, as we're walking from the head wall of the Pomelo Mine, at least one of the mined areas here, we've come across um, uh, what some of the outcrop uh, looks like. And this is the underlying bedrock. And this gives a good example of the type of material that makes up this area. And here we see some feldspar. Uh, and this is a pretty big chunk of feldspar. It's, uh, um, it's pretty big. It's about three feet long and uh, two and a half feet wide. And feldspar uh, is used as an abrasive. I'm sure you've all heard of feld, fel, uh, Fels nap, naphtha soap. And feldspar is uh, one of the components of, of that. Now, what we also see here is we see some quartzite here uh, within the matrix of feldspar and and, and quartz, and there's a whole whole mix of fairly large crystals here throughout. Uh, and as you can see, you know, these deposits run underneath uh, for a long, long way. Pretty hard. example of the feldspar. So, this was a very popular soap when I was a child. Okay, I'm here with John McCauley, a uh, member of the Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society, and he's, uh, you're working in an area. What are you uh, doing, John? Well, uh, basically it looks like an old uh, tailings pile from, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe 25, 30, who knows, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just, uh, in this type of mining, we're just taking a, a rake, almost like an old clammer's rake, and uh, scraping away the top surface so we can get some of the overburden from the forest off of it and see what we have underneath. Yeah. Uh, what are you, um, uh, b based on what you see now, what are you, uh, what uh, we, are you finding? We got a little bit of mixed uh, smoky quartz, a little bit of, uh, you know, darker crystals, uh, nothing spectacular, but uh, mm -hmm. 
you never know. Yeah, you know, we'll yeah. see what happens by the end of the day. Yeah. Would you uh, characterize this area as a uh, one of the classic pegmatite areas in New Hampshire? I think it, I think I would. Yeah. yeah. In my in my limited experience, yeah. yes, I would. Yeah. Sure. Well, well, I mean, it looks like a pretty nice area. Um, anyone just walking through the woods would probably just walk right by it. But uh, sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting prospect. So you think we'll get our cars out of here? <laughs> I know I will, but I'm sure we're going to be helping some others out of here. Yeah, it's a, it's a mess. Okay, but, uh, uh, dig on. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Great pleasure. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm here with Suzanne Geringer, who's a new member of the Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society. Looks like you're having fun. Oh, this is great, and what a wonderful weekend. Yep. So, what do first you... time out in the woods. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and we indeed are in the woods. Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah. What do you have? What have you found well, here? Well, I'm brand new, so I'm really, you know, uh, <laughs> learning by asking other people things. I found this pretty piece, though it has a lot of oh, mica. mica in it yeah. and some different colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just like the shape. I think I'm going to put that in my garden, yep. some interesting plant near it. Yeah, well, that'll clean up nice with a little water. Yeah. The shiny... Stuff is my, muscovite mica. Oh, muscovite. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, that's what that is. And the orange tends to be rust okay. that has formed uh, because there's iron in the rocks mm -hmm. and it's oxidized. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you've got some interesting uh, interesting crystals here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was just sitting right some here. Quartz. Quartz. And feldspar. Wow. See? Wow. I'm learning great. a lot right there. In this black, I'm not quite sure what that is. Hmm. But very good. Yes. I and uh, look at this things. great piece. Isn't that pretty? Quartz. Yes. Gorgeous. The quartz is really yeah. pretty. Yeah. So clean. Yes, it is. Amazingly it is. clean. And then this is another piece, uh, I guess, it has some of that yep. same uh, quartz. And that and almost you see looks the like a little smoky quartz, but yep. maybe not. No, it looks, uh, I was talking to a, a fellow over here, and he, he felt that a lot of the quartz was tending towards smoky, mm -hmm. trying to be smoky. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, so that appealed to me, too. Great, great. Well, dig on. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. I'm having a good time. Great. Thank fun you. being in the dirt. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so... Here we are, and we've stumbled across a um, very nice piece of feldspar and quartz in the wood that's really peppered with a lot of mica in it, and it's a very attractive piece, one that we would love to have in our garden if, um, if we had a backhoe in here and could remove it, but that's not going to happen, so we're just going to have to enjoy what's here. Uh, something I wanted to point out here is the mica. There's some beautiful sheets of mica in this uh, uh, rock here. And we see these sheets of mica that have actually broken away. And mica has the characteristic that it, it foliates and it splits in sheets. And the reason that is, you can see here, and these sheets are called books of mica, okay, because the books are like pages, pages in a book. So these are called books of mica. And what happens is as the melt, as, as the different minerals are solidifying out of the melt, the minerals tend to align according to their, to their atoms, the way their atoms align. And the alignment of the mica makes for this what's called schistosity, which allows it to really foliate and peel it off. And that's just the way, just the characteristic of the atomic structure of the elements that make up the mica. Mica had a lot of uses. Uh, it was used for magnetos heavily during World War II. New Hampshire was a, a, a prime resource for um, uh, mica. It was also used as furnace glass, okay, for glass in uh, furnace or high temperature applications where you wanted to be able to observe what was going on in a heated, a heated area. And we see here on this deposit in matrix where you have quartz and feldspar and some quartz that's trying to be smoky quartz it's a little bit dark you also see some black here which could be um, could be tourmaline actually that probably is tourmaline and then you see the the pieces of mica in here and this is typical of what we find in a New Hampshire pegmatite and this is really 
uh, a great area for finding these sorts of uh, minerals. Here's, here's another mica, and this is muscovite mica. The clear mica is called muscovite. The black mica is called biotite. So that's where we're at. Hi, I'm here with Anita Honkinen. And uh, Anita's a longtime member of the Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society mm -hmm. and the editor of the Pegmatite. I so, am. welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So, Anita, uh, what have you been finding here? Well, this site, there's a lot of pegmatite, very appropriate, mm -hmm. um, but it's really lots of quartz and lots of very white feldspar. Right? Um, and I found this piece, though, that has nice. Um, black tourmaline mm -hmm. called Schroll. Right? Schroll? Schroll. Mm -hmm. yeah. That uh, sounds German. Probably. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure what the origin is, yeah. but most people just say black tourmaline. But, okay. Um, and you can tell because of the striations in it. Mm -hmm. And it's embedded in some muscovite, mm -hmm. which is classic to find in pegmatite also. Yep. So um, I was looking in a lot of places around here finding nothing, yep. and then there's a dump over there, and I just started digging into it, and turned it over and I found one piece with little crystals in it and then I found another I broke it open and it broke right along the mica which is classic yep. for mica because yep. it has that one plane of cleavage yes and nice nice crystals of the shroll in it so yeah um, not that they're jammy you're not going to use them for anything but they're they make a nice display yeah <laughs> Anita can you describe for uh, for our audience what a pegmatite is yeah pegmatite is a, it has large crystals in it, um, usually more than two inches in size. Okay. Um, it's an intrusion, meaning it was originally hot molten material mm -hmm. that gets injected into fractures in the rocks. And it can be anywhere from several inches wide, the intrusion, to many, 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 many feet. Right? Mm -hmm. But the characteristic of a pegmatite is that it has large crystals in it. Right? Mm -hmm. So you find quartz crystals, you find feldspar crystals all over the place. Um, but they're small, right? But mm -hmm. if ever, all of them are kind of large, then you have what's that? That's that rock right there. I don't know if she can. Pan, if you can pan down mm -hmm. to that rock, that is classic pegmatite, right? Because there's a very large, large crystal, right? That mm -hmm. that's like one piece mm -hmm. of feldspar there. Feldspar, right? right. Yep. And so, you know, it's we typically look for pegmatites when we're looking for minerals because of the geology, the chemistry in it, they sometimes will have unusual minerals in it, whether it's the, the tourmalines. Mm -hmm. Here it's only the black ones. If you're up in Maine, you get yep. the pretty colored ones. Um, barrels sometime. Yep. Um, yep. Matter of fact, one of the, Michelle found her barrel not oh, far I from remember. here. Yeah, very Beautiful large one. Beautiful right. barrel. Beautiful barrel. Yeah. Um, but because of the chemistry, there's usually hot water associated with pegmentite when it's when it's molten, yep. and the water tends to allow the crystals to get bigger. I see. It also allows different unusual minerals to form sometime. I see. Things that we would consider gemstones or semi-precious gemstones. I see. Now, when you're looking at uh, smaller crystals, what what would uh, uh, result in a crystal? Uh, uh, in a small crystal being formed versus a large crystal? Is it time? The standard answer is time, right? And generally, the slower the magma cools, the bigger the crystals get. Right? Okay. It just has more time for all the atoms to bond together mm -hmm. to get nice big crystals, yep. right? Just like you, when you were two years old, were smaller than you are now, you've had more time to oh, grow, well. yeah? <laughs> and we're all bigger, yeah. right? Um, but sometimes things like water can accept, can change things. So like if there is, if you, and it's really weird to think of magma being wet, but mm -hmm. if there is more water in it, it actually will allow the crystals to grow bigger. Um, so a dry magma cooling for a thousand years, a wet magma cooling for a thousand years, the wet magma will have bigger crystals in it. I see, I yeah. see. Now, some of these crystals, we're, we're talking, uh, I would think, on the order of millions of years. Pro of, yeah, uh, long time, of, of hundreds cooling. of thousands, millions yeah. of years, yeah. yeah. I mean, because when we're used to thinking of, like, seeing lava flowing out of the volcanoes mm -hmm. in Hawaii, and that mm -hmm. will cool pretty quickly, sure. instantaneously, in some sure. cases. Hits right? the water you and you get the those water and you get the, Right, and you get obsidian forming the glasses, yep. volcanic glasses. Um, but the stuff around here, 
it was 10 miles on, underground when this was forming, right? Um, so it cooled for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, if not a million or so, yeah. totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Um yeah, it always blows my mind, and I think that's one of the things that keeps me interested right. in geology. Well, it is, because when you think about it, if we're saying these rocks formed 10 miles underground, they're not 10 miles underground now. That's they're right. They're right on the surface, which means that everything that was above them has been wiped out, right? Right, right. Washed out to sea. Probably in the uh, oceans in now. The, it's, uh, it's the ocean yeah. floor now, yeah. yeah. And Participating right. in the mm -hmm. up-and-coming rock right. cycle. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, so this yep. was not the surface yep. millions of years ago. Yeah. This was deep underground. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's well, a dynamic Earth. Is is yep. you know, who was yep. it? James Hutton way back when first said dynamic Earth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No vestige of a beginning. beginning. No. no something, something other than end. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, yeah, right like exactly. Yeah, I should have that memorized yeah, by yeah, now. Yeah, but we should. Really. Okay. Uh, well, Anita, thank you very thank much. You. And. Yeah. Uh, Happy Keep filming. digging. Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully I find something like a barrel. Yeah. That'd be great. good. Well, we're finishing up our trip today at the Pomlo Mine in Gilsum, New Hampshire. It was a great day of collecting, beautiful weather throughout the day, specimens all around of, of New Hampshire pegmatites. We've got some great examples of pegmatite, so we're going to bring home to use in our garden. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next time on Littleton Rocks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.